But I just want to say about your ethics. Uh, I think that anyone who's interested in this, the, the, the ethical position of the European Committee on Radiation Risk is quite different from the ICRP. <coughs> The ICRP ethical situation is a very outdated system called utilitarianism, which was developed by Bentham and John Stuart Mill. And basically, it, with utilitarianism, you can have a slave society because the advantages of the many outweigh, you know, the advantages to the few. And so we don't believe we believe in human rights, and we believe that you have the absolute human right to the integrity of your body and the decision to refuse to allow it to be contaminated with radioactivity. And that's a, that's a fundamental human right. It's a UN human right. It is indeed. However, societies also have rights. And you always have the problem of balancing the individual versus society. And as you've seen, we also have a, a duty ethics uh, uh, which is expressed in the terms of those limits and which we've strengthened with those constraints. So, uh, and you cannot escape some amount of utilitarianism. Okay, I think that I should now leave a bit of time to the audience and I've thrown all the tomatoes that I intend to throw and philosophy. But unfortunately, one tried to repeat these experiments. We wrote about it and I can say that I have tried to see what has happened since then. And they have not been able to repeat these experiments showing that heavy Oshie editors were much more harmful than it's we think. It may be have been experimental faults in it, but it was a real experimental work on mice. And it's very puzzling to me still why uh, it has happened so that we could, they are not able to, to really show that Oshie electrons emitters are more harmful. It, they should be if you if they go into a DNA and they m might be so, but it's still a puzzle on it. I just tell you that there are things that has not been resolved in the in the radiation protection area. Well, uh, can I say? Can try pressing the button, see if it works. Well, this one. Yeah. Is that is that no? Is that on? No. Hello. Anyway, you can hear me, can't you? No, you can't hear me. Okay. Well, we're talking about OJ OJ emitters, yeah. Okay, well, we considered ozone emitters in cherry, uh, and nothing ever came of it, because nothing much came of cherry. But we consider, in the UCRR, we put a weighting on ozone emitters. So, so they carry a weighting. Well, this is what the UCRR does. The weighting factors that the, that the ICRP use, which are weighting factors for ionization density, which they add to, to alpha particles, we also add to ozone emitters. And they will get a separate weighting if the OJ emitting element binds to DNA. Because obviously if you have bound to DNA and an OJ emission, then you're going to get twice the effect. So that is included in the ECR, along with a lot of other things that the ICRP don't include. I'm aware that there are different studies pointing in different directions, and I can just confirm that OJ electrons are, are on the table for discussion at almost every meeting. But nothing gets done. <laughs> that was an unnecessary quid. <laughs> well, it's nevertheless true, though, isn't it, Jack? I mean, you know, these people, I mean, we get irritated by this endless, endless sort of, uh, you know, prevarication. Do I, am I, am but I but talking... as long as you get opposing results from different studies, it's very hard to recommend something uh, which makes a great difference to, for instance, nuclear medicine. Yeah, okay. Roland, and then yourself. Would you mind introducing yourself, if you don't mind? Roland Davidson, uh, the NGO organization ZERO, Swedish Renewable Energy Organization. And I will ask Miles to translate my question into English, understandable. I put it in Swedish. You are the translator. Yo, the most you listen. I put the question in Swedish. Yeah. Uh, efter Tjernobyl så har man fått väldigt små skördar av frukt eller minskande skördar av frukt och man har fått ett minskande antal insekter, bin och flugor och så vidare. 
Och samtidigt så kan jag då ställa mig frågan, har det här någon betydelse när vi ser att ett av de stora utsläppen från våra svenska kärnkraftverk är radioaktiva gaser? Och nu har vi haft väldigt mycket utsläpp av tritium, visserligen har de inte så stor påverkan från läckage i turbinerna i Oskarshamn. Men vi har andra utsläpp av krypton 81, krypton 85, vi har utsläpp av radon, xenon, alla dessa radioaktiva ämnen med 14 nollar efter Utsläpp varje år som värderas i naturen kommer det att påverka våra insekter eftersom de har en väldigt kort livscykel. Okay. Well, there have been many, many anecdotal um, reports similar to yours, and and in this book here, the there's a lot of evidence that the radiation from Chernobyl, the radio nuclear from Chernobyl, affected the entire <coughs> animal kingdom in the areas where the contamination was. So the answer is, is uh, clearly around nuclear sites there will be similar effects. There was a study done in Plymouth from the tritium released from the, ch the naval dockyard there, which showed that the developmental and larval stages of um, a, num a number of marine creatures, simple marine creatures, invertebrates were, uh, were, 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 were affected by tiny doses of tritium below, but the effective doses of tritium well below one millisievert. Um, and tritium, of course, is, is, is of concern because it's a beta emitter, but with very short range, so very low energy beta emitter. So for one sievert or one millisievert of radiation from tritium, you have lots and lots of hits, lots and lots of tracks. And this may well be what, uh, the, the reason, but of course it's just, you know, arm waving. Well, not, not just perhaps, uh, but let me take another take on this because uh, it's known already since the 60s uh, in experimental systems that if you irradiate populations of fruit flies generation after generation, uh, they actually produce more flies, more unit biomass per unit food put into the experimental system, uh, which proves, of course, uh, a fact which is not all that nice. It proves that radiation causes mutations and for a population uh, the, the population might actually be served by a high, in, in certain circumstances by a higher mutation rate but of course this is at the cost of quote suffering unquote for the individuals because many of these mutants will be useless and harmful uh, so uh, there, there's no question of course that radiation causes genetic mutations uh, these might be uh, bad for individuals, they're not necessarily bad for the population and if you now go to, to Chernobyl, uh, of course uh, there's quite a lot of, of wildlife, there's quite a lot of uh, plants and animals uh, living there very happily and uh, one of the major uh, disturbance factors is, uh, has gone away with the people who live there. Next question. We are all mutants. <laughs> My name is Andrzej Wojcik, I'm from the Stockholm University. I'm a radiation biologist since 25 years and I'm the vice president of the European Radiation Research Society. And uh, I'm not, I don't belong to any agency like, or I'm not associated with neither with Danske nor with um, ICRP nor any other radiation protection authority. I'm a, I'm a researcher. And uh, well, it's, it's more like a comment that I would like to uh, Give because I, I, I think I know the literature about the problems of uh, related to the problems of low dose exposure because I have been working on the effects of low dose exposure. And uh, you see, Chris, for every publication that you showed or for every evidence that you showed, I could uh, show you two other papers from coming, for example, from the book of Don Lucky about the hormetic effects of low levels of radiation. And uh, but as, as you mentioned at a certain moment, we could uh, throw each other throw at each other papers uh, showing quite different effects and nothing would come out of it. And uh, you see, it's uh, like uh, you, you, have, you, you have been talking a lot about the childhood leukemia. The German study, this um, newest case control study that was published, the so-called KICK study. You see, the, the problem there was that uh, they found, there's no question that they found a cluster of leukemia around uh, German nuclear power plants but it was certainly not related to radiation. Mm. And there are other factors that uh, 
cause childhood leukemia. And there has been a number of studies, not only in England, not only by Richard Daw, showing that uh, there are clusters of leukemia around nuclear power plants that were built, or also around no other large industrial entities that were built, uh, with respect to nuclear power plants, that were built but they were never run, they were never operated. And we simply don't know why these clusters arise. And uh, with respect, and the situation with low, dose, low doses of ionizing radiation is very similar to electromagnetic fields, to the question of um, healthy food or non-healthy food, the effect of food on cancer, uh, the effect of sun, well, sunlight is clear, but uh, yes, electromagnetic fields, I think, is, is, is a good example. You see, the effects that we talk about uh, of ionizing radiation in the range of up to a few millisieverts are so low just like uh, electromagnetic field, just like um, factors in, in the food that you eat. They're so low that they are, you cannot really pick them up. And uh, there are so many other confounders that influence the results of the study uh, that it's basically impossible to say from at least the epidemiological evidence is not there and it will never be there because uh, the number of people that are sick is too low to give uh, statistical power to the studies. It will never be able to show you that, um, uh, that radiation is in the low dose ranges, harmful. You, you have mentioned Chernobyl. Uh, well, these studies that you talked about, about um, childhood leukemia after Chernobyl, there are quite a number of studies showing that this is not true. And uh, with respect to life expectancy in Belarus and in Ukraine and Russia, it has gone down by 10 years approximately, and this is due to a collapse of the Soviet Union. It's due to the collapse of the, of the medical healthcare system. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> because I come from Poland. I know how it looks like. You cannot know these oh, things. Yes. Uh, well, I, then there is a very good report by the, published by WHO uh, about the effects of Chernobyl, where all these factors are mentioned. I really don't see why WHO should be biased. In their, you must. In their you, must well, you must. No, I must not this, do this. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Well, then, I, am, I am a serious scientist. Well, why don't I finish, and then okay. you can have your response. No, I, I have finished. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I find your, inter your your remarks very interesting because I hear this a lot because you believe you know you are right, uh, and and your and your mind is closed to the evidence. You, you, tell, you tell me, you say, that the statistical power of studies, epidemiological studies, the, the statistical power is too low to yeah. determine the, whether or not there are low-dose effects or not. But you can only say that if you already know what those effects are. Do you not see this? I mean, can you not see the, the vast pit into which you've fallen there? Because in order to say that a statistical power should be something, you have to have a risk factor to begin with to know what the numbers of people that you're going to find will be. And therefore you're using the risk factor which we are attacking in order to generate the statistical power which you then say doesn't exist. It, it, it's just bad science, I'm afraid. Now what I'm saying you should do, and maybe you say you mustn't do anything because obviously you know the answer, but what I would invite you to do is to take that video, there's a DVD there which you can have, you can play on a DVD player, it's quite entertaining, and it shows uh, a Swiss t television documentary about a most important meeting in Kiev about the Chernobyl accident. And at, in that video you will see two people uh, uh, covering up the effects of, of the Chernobyl accident on camera, on camera. So I invite you to have a look at that. And, and when you wonder about why I get irritated and why I say the things I do, it's because I'm continually having to face people who believe they know what is right on the basis of the fact that they are scientists and, those, and therefore they feel superior to everybody else. Okay. Do you want to come back? Can you get a, get a response, please? You see, research is not based on looking for truth. Research is based on... Uh, finding correlations between facts, and for this we have certain mechanisms. And uh, there are statistical mechanisms to evaluate the power of studies, and, uh, and the way how to perform studies. So when I hear you saying about that you have been going around knocking at people's door and asking when they have got cancer, I'm sorry, but this is not serious science. Why? <laughs> because it will, you are from the very beginning biased. By why? No, why, why is it not serious oh, science? Okay. This are they going not... to say that they have cancer when they don't have cancer? Is that what you're saying? 
No, but because you. Well, why would they say? Well, why would they say that they don't have? Gas it's exactly the same. Like when you you see uh, when you look at uh, the effect of mobile phones, and you talk with people, and then you start to collect data based on on. Uh, what the people the people came to they no, no, they, no, they, no. they they have harm they experience harm from using mobile phones because they have headaches and this is a proof for the um, dangerous effects of um, of electromagnetic fields. I don't claim that people have no headache. Uh, I, yes, of course they, they will have headache, but this is not a, a, a reasonable way to approach the problem. It's not a reasonable way to go to people and knock at the door and ask whether they have had cancer in their in the household in their family and. Uh, even for the simple reason, because you will not be able to get an appropriate control group by doing by this approach. And, uh, <coughs> well, you're wrong. We can talk about this afterwards, but you can get an appropriate control group. Yeah, like that. I would just like to say that that we, we can, can we have to be out of this room by four. So I think that we'll take a break at quarter two, and then uh, see if people want to continue. Yourself, and then you my, my name is Bjorn Sidewall. I'm a medical radiation biologist. I've been in the field for about 35 years. Uh, at various in institutions and so on. I have three points I'd like to comment. The first is about the risk factor. 5% fatal cancers perceived as uh, uh, Jack uh, uh, said. And this uh, number comes from survivors of those who received doses uh, at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, that's a, a very unfortunate event of course in the history, but that's among the best available information we can get for high dose rate uh, um, uh, exposure. And so what else could you use when you're discussing statistical, uh, if, if we take for instance a German study, we would need the order of 10, 10, 100, at least 10 million children enabled to, t uh, if if those low doses really caused uh, those cancers uh, in order to detect a, an increase in cancer. Now, there's another way, and this is my second point, about, lo uh, at, about looking at the childhood leukemias. And that is, you said, uh, Chris, at the end of your talk, this is about population mixing and stuff or something like that. I think this is very important. You should all listen to this very carefully. Because if you look at the t uh, literature, what people are doing to understand why certain children get cancers, and in particular the most common uh, among children, which is the uh, one called A -A ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, it turns out that there are a number of other associated factors, socioeconomic factors, population mixing is that uh, about infections, there is a lot, it's been suspected for more than 50 years. Now, there is definite proof that some viruses, these are DNA sequence specific, so we know exactly what these viruses are doing. And some children obviously have, get this infection during pregnancy, when the mother is pregnant, and these cause specific transmutations, which is rearrangements of chromosomes and so on, so we understand what happens. Isn't that worth calling? Now, we're talking also about relative risks. The German study <coughs> tells about a factor of 1.4, 1.7, or something like that, depending on how you interpret it. But most of that is at one of the nuclear power plants in Germany, the Krumme. Uh, if you look at other correlations, you'll see <coughs> relative risk factors that are not 1.5, but rather more than 5. And the strongest one I have found in the literature is by Californian children eating hot dogs, and those who get more than 12 hot dog meals per month have a 480% uh, increase, which is a relative risk of 5.8. Increased in a ALL. -L -L. Yeah. I'm not saying that the hot dogs are causing the ALL, -L, but they're probably pointing at families who are of poor, have poor econo economy and, and all that. And so there could be other things here. They are living among waste dumps or near uh, highways and so on. Mm -hmm. And so there is a complex world. And for, if you want to understand it, you must go into the literature and look at this. And it's not just Richard Dahl who came up with the population mixing, because there are a number of other authors there. Last thing I want to say to put some perspective into things. Jack, you mentioned uh, the fruit fly experiment that was published 40 years ago. 
And that experiment gave, they gave pure plot, Ballon, pure group, equivalent to 60 gray, which you translate for gamma radiation to people would be like 60 silver, an enormous dose. Three generations they gave them, and they followed them for two years. They repeated the experiment three times and got the same result I, uh, each time. I'm not saying that radiation is good for you and you should improve everyone by <coughs> irradiating them because there are other factors too which I can't go into. But it tells some about the proportions. These 60 gray. Now, how much do we get in Sweden from all the nuclear power put together? Radiation doses. We're talking about 10 so called man sievert. That computerized tomography in Sweden gives us today about 3,500 man sievert reading. Those are some relations and perspectives. I don't think you were listening to my talk about dose. All, all of you and, and the previous gentleman who were talking have been using dose as if it's some meaningful concept. Okay. You, you ask what different experiment that could be done. You say that on the basis of the risk model from Hiroshima... Uh, um, it's not a model, it's fact. No, it's not. It's a model. I'm afraid the model is associated with taking a risk to Japanese survivors and transfer, uh, who were uh, given an enormously large external dose of gamma rays and using that as a model to look at the effects of people who were given doses of internal radiation from strontium-90. Now, that is not scientifically valid, however you put it. There is no scientific philosophy that will enable you to extract the experiences of people who were, accused, uh, who were exposed to a single large acute dose and to convert that into chronic internal dose to substances that bind to DNA. And the reason you can't do that, well, you know, the reason that you can't do that is perfectly straightforward and absolutely rational. It's because you're talking about ultimately the density of ionization at the DNA. Now that is not going to be the same as this Auger gentleman was mentioning earlier. This is not going to be the same for a substance bound to the DNA, which is kicking electrons into the DNA. And it, you you are because you're you're talking about absorbed dose. External acute radiation. Well, sorry, exter the external acute radiation uh, uh, exposure of the Hiroshima survivors is the basis for the risk model that, that, that Dr. Valentin and his, his bunch of people are <laughs> using to predict the effects of internal radiation, and this is not scientifically valid. All right, I got one other point while we're at, at it, and that's the other guy who was talking about the mobile phone controversy. Okay, let's go there. Now, actually, it's not about whether people think they might have had a headache once they phoned their friend on the mobile phone after somebody asked them in a questionnaire. No. It's about studies like studies by Ole Johansson at your Karolinska Institute that, that showed slides at the Royal Society when I was there last year showing the damage to skin tissue from exposure to normal uh, radio frequency radiation from a mobile phone, which was identical to the damage to skin tissue from fairly large doses of ionizing radiation. It's also about acoustic neuroma studies, which show that people who get brain tumors in their brains following the use of mobile phones always get the brain tumor on the same side that they hold the mobile phone, whether they're left-handed or right-handed. So I'm afraid there are ways that you can do studies that you may not feel are, are accurate or valid scientifically, but which yet to give the correct answer. Okay. Hi, Roland. Roland, you're, you're third, you're Roland. Okay. Uh, we can give the gentleman a uh, short response if you like. Yes. Okay, I just want to say one thing here very clearly. I refer to external acute exposure. I have nothing against a separate scientific discussion about uh, uh, part, uh, particle uh, uh, radioactivity and internal contamination and so on, but that's another discussion. But I don't like to get the rotten tomato thrown at me about something that I did not say. Oh, all right, sorry. I, uh, I compare gamma, external gamma radiation neutrons with external gamma radiation neutrons. And most of the radiation we're talking about, if you, uh, for instance, exposure at the nuclear power plant. No. Is, no, but if you're talking about at the nuclear power plant, 
it, it's not about internal it contact. is it is it, about internal it's about releases really from the past yes. and they are sensitive to gamma exposure the cause of the childhood leukemia is near the nuclear plants <coughs> is the external is the internal radiation from the releases from the past that's what we're saying but what, what I'm saying is that, is that, that all, of these, all of these topics which I put up here are about internal radiation from releases from the plants. The Sellafield, the, the, the leukemia all along the coast of Sellafield and all along the Welsh coast and all these, these, event, these uh, discoveries which I've made from the epidemiology, all of those are due <coughs> to exposures from internal radionuclides. I, I agree with them about external radiation. I, I don't have a big, a big argument with external radiation. If external radiation was as dangerous as I'm saying internal <coughs> radiation is, nobody would ever come out of a hospital after having an x-ray. They would have died long ago. They would have just fallen there dead as soon as they gave them the x-ray. I don't have a problem with external radiation. External radiation delivers a particular number of ionizations per cell. I mean, we can calculate what it is. You can take the, you can take the number of MEVs, you can divide it into the number of, 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 of ionization events, and you can say the density of ionization is so many events per, per cc. You can do that. But if you stick a piece of uranium in there, or a piece of plutonium, or some other piece of crap that produces this radioactivity intrinsically, then you get much, much higher doses. I mean, one alpha track across a cell will give you a dose of half a sievert. One alpha track and will probably kill the cell. Now, what's going to happen when you put a particle in there which, has got, which is solid plutonium or solid uranium and is producing all these beta emissions from the photoelectrons and so on? You're getting very high local density of ionization, and that's the concern that I have, that this external risk model doesn't represent a proper assessment of the risk from that kind of exposure. It's now quarter two, and I'd like to continue until four. Jack Valentine has already said he has to leave at four, but if people need to leave, please feel free to do so. First, Johan, then yourself, and then yourself. Okay, my name is Johan Swan. I work for this uh, with nuclear waste issues for the Swedish Nuclear Environmental Movement. Not, not milk, just MKG, it's an organization. Now, I, I'm a physicist to start with, but I work mostly with policy issues, energy policy, nuclear policy. For a long time, I did some work. I, I did some, you know, it was, it wasn't working, but I did some studies of radiation physics and so on when I was at university. Uh, what I find is interesting is that ex exactly what you, you Chris, were mentioning now the, the difference between uh, internal radiation and external radiation. And I, I understand the controversy. Um, my, uh, my, my thinking about this on the on an almost intuitive level, not scientific level, is that that uh, mankind has been exposed to natural radiation, uh, uh, potassium-40, for example, or other things, for a long time. And, and those particles have evol evolved, uh, have been part of our evolution. Now, when we uh, insert artificial radioactive particles, they might not end up in the body in the same way as, as the natural uh, radiation, the particles of natural radiation. Uh, is this something that, that is being studied? I, I asked both of you actually about this. I mean, because we are maybe looking for some sort of understanding why it could be that the, that the internal radiation is perhaps more dangerous than we have thought before. Um, it, it can be likened perhaps to the chemical issues where we, we think that artificial chemical compounds are more dangerous than natural compounds. That, that's not necessarily true, but it, it can be, it, it's, some of it's very true at least. Could it be that artificial radioactive particles, uh, radi uh, not particles, other uh, elements, uh, have a, a different function or in our bodies compared to natural ones? Shall we like, let Jack respond to that first? Uh, at, at the level of something happening within DNA, I would say there's no difference uh, between artificial and other radionuclides. But of course, uh, the one thing is clear, this is pointing to the fact that some material binds to DNA, and of course the doses become different in that case. Uh, that we have been talking about uh, alpha emitters, uh, where you get a completely different dose than if you have gamma rays. So, uh, of course, there are differences, although not at the level of, of DNA once the ionization happens. 
What I would like is for the ICRP or for some government to appoint me to the head of a, of a committee of young, clever mathematicians, physicists, physical chemists, biologists, to investigate this exact issue, because nobody has really looked at it very closely. No, that's the answer. The only book that I've found in, uh, in existence is a Russian book. The Russians have been reasonably interested in this up to some point in time. And they produced a report in 1972, which began to look at the effects of internal radiation. But they said there was a lot more to do. And as far as I know, nobody has done it. That is to say, nobody has published anything about it. Now, this is quite a different matter, that whether somebody has done it or whether they've published something about it. I mean, there are a number of, uh, of, of communities that do research, particularly the military community. Uh, and it could be that they've done the research and they just haven't published it because it would be too embarrassing to do so. Pass the mic to. Confusion. <laughs> In case of nuclear accidents, confusion is one of the most important and most lethal and detrimental factors when the authorities are to master the consequences. I am Jorgen Christensen, consulting engineer. After the Chernobyl accident or disaster, the Stockholm County Council asked me to instruct them very quickly about radiation and what the consequences would be and what to do. And that's what I do as well as I could. And thus I became aware of the risk of confusion. And Taking part in the conference, for instance, by EIA on the, on the consequences to society of radiation, this was confirmed very expressly by those reporting from Chernobyl. For instance, the Dr. Nunu, confusion, and what is a main reason for confusion? The units. The systems of units used, it's a terrible system of units. It's contradictory to proper principles of and uh, systematic of, of units and uh, I shall take the liberty just to, to quote a, a phrase or two from a paper I presented to the conference. Poor agu and violation of epistemological definitions and principles impair comprehension and statements about ionizing radiation and uh, abolishment of Becquerel, Gray and Seward is one of the suitable measures I find to be urgently needed. I shan't go into detail but I take the pleasure to present to Mr. Buss this, this paper. <laughs> Dr. Valentin has already. <laughs> My name is. is yeah. I'll take Roland's question. Okay, after the Chernobyl accident, I, I got hold of a Geiger meter. Uh, it was only one place in, in Europe I found any for sale. They were all sold out. I phoned all around Europe, Italy, France and everything. I found five in England and two were bought for Sweden. One I went around with myself. And, and um, uh, the alarm was set at 20 counts per second, which was to, to uh, uh, get out of a German laboratory and have it sanitized. That was 20, that level. Still, one year after Chernobyl, inside and outside in Stockholm, the level was over 20. So the alarm always went on when I put it off, uh, put it on. Uh, but what surprised me was that the numbers we got of the radiation in Sweden was always measured one meter over the ground, all over Sweden. And I think that's because of this controversy. Because when I went down on the ground, if I had 20 in the, in the air, it would be 600 or even under, in Stockholm under the 
the pipe coming from the roof, roof it was three and a half thousand, and I put it through the, 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 the uh, x-ray machine in Ireland at the airport, and then it only went up to 1500. So the radiation under the, the, the drain pipe from the roof was the double of this uh, x-ray machine. And so the, the numbers which were presented to the people all around Sweden was taken at one meter's height, and they were, they were not looking at the ground, but when I went there, the, 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 the levels would go up because, and, and I, I would breathe these things in, I, uh, people would drink it and eat it. And I think this is a controversy, that in Sweden we were used to having the, the radiation in the, in the rock, but people don't eat and breathe very much rock. And this was completely new dimension, and I think this, this is the controversy which we have, have to... The, the, the reasoning probably was that a person is average approximately two meters high, so the radiation from the rock that reaches a person can be measured from one meters high. But this was nonsense measurements of, on, on the effects of Chernobyl, and I, it seems that this controversy that you have is explaining now exactly the problem I was wondering, why the heck do they not tell us what's there on the ground? So, is, is this, do, would, do, does anyone of you know if, why, why they measured one meter of, of, of over the ground? Was this the, the, the conception that, that you could compare the, the, the stuck radiation source of, of the, the rock with, with what was breathed and eaten? We'll let Jack Valentine respond first. But, but you don't breathe uh, the, the soil area. You, you don't eat the soil area. You, you, you breathe and, and uh, breathe air which is uh, near your nose, as it were. And, and there, there are lots of technical reasons why you do these measurements in that way. Uh, I, I'm not prepared to go into the details, but, but it, it is not a way of trying to hide anything from anybody. It's, it's a way of trying to get uh, comparable measurements uh, and to, to be able to calculate uh, the position in a sensible way. There, of course, there were other measurements uh, which were presented to members of the public all the time. Uh, for no. instance, the level of contamination in grass. And if you didn't see them, I'm sorry, sir, but the, there were measurements of the level of contamination in grass which were published all the time. But there were also uh, measurements which, f from Swedish officials which were made on Seidel's story and which were published in, in, by uh, or Siemens had the, the results and Germany could read it. But in Sweden, it went, when journalists went to the radio or television, they got a pink paper that this was, was dangerous for the pu pu public to get nervous. The nervousness uh, of the fear was more dangerous than radiation. So it was... It was uh, 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 with, you would go to jail if you published the, the facts. This, yes. this was the, the crisis in the Swedish publication. Okay, so this, this is very interesting because what we have here is a scientific experiment. Now, the gentleman at the back say, would say that, that, that what you did was not scientific, okay? So we can ignore it because it was not scientific. It wasn't published in a, in a, you know, you just went out with a guide counter and you hadn't calibrated it. You just I waved it around the place. And, uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm sure there'd be lots of expl <laughs> explanations here about how it could be wrong. But what I say is, there, what's interesting about this is, if, is I know about this, the, the, the radiation levels because I do lots of court cases on this. And incidentally, I win them all, all right? So watch it. Because what's going to happen is that you people are going to be in court again and again and again and again, and you're going to lose every time. And, and, and I'm not, maybe not you, but the nuclear industry who use your, and the environment people who use your model are going to lose, because they are losing regularly. What happened there was that you were measuring at one meter gamma rays, and this is where they measure gamma rays at one meter, because a person is about uh, two meters high, and so it's considered to be the average gamma ray dose, and it's a convention that, that gamma rays are measured with Geiger counters at that level so that they can be compared around different parts of the country. Because so, obviously if somebody was measuring here and somebody was measuring there, they would be not comparable, so it's just a convention. But the interesting thing is that with gamma rays, if it had just been the rocks, and you'd have brought the, the Geiger counter down close to the ground, you wouldn't have got much of a bigger reading, you see. The reason you got a big reading was because your Geiger counter was responding to beta, beta particles, which have a much shorter range. 
And this means that, that Sweden was co uh, contaminated with hot isotopes which were beta emitters, probably tellurium-132 at the beginning, which is a, a kind of forgotten isotope which came out of Chernobyl. And there was a lot of it because it's quite gaseous. So this suggests to me that there was quite high contamination in Sweden. And I'm interested in that because Martin Tondell did a study, an epidemiological study, which showed increases in cancer in levels of, in parts of Sweden that had high, high contamination or conventionally higher contamination. And he was suddenly attacked by everybody you know, who, who, who brought in the ICRP model and said, I'm sorry, Martin, but you must be wrong. You know, your science is incorrect. You haven't got the right sort of doses. It couldn't possibly have happened and all this kind of twaddle. So what I'm saying is that this, for me, and I listen as a scientist, as a scientist, which I am, I listen to all the information. So if I knock on the door and somebody says, yes, I had cancer, that is information. You don't have to read it in the International Journal of Radiation Biology before you believe something. Otherwise, we'd never have survived as a human race because it didn't exist a hundred years ago. <laughs> I just wanted to add that, of course, I was very much involved uh, during the Chernobyl accident and uh, all else is okay, but do not try to claim that any information was secret, that there were any threats of punishing people. That simply was not true. And uh, it, it is so boring to meet people who come with these claims which uh, they cannot substantiate. Uh, this is the one sort of thing that gets me angry when people accuse me and my colleagues of having been, been not dishonest. You, not you. It was, it was a psychological defense. And Lars Westman tried to publicize these pictures and he got, he got shown at the TV this pink paper from the psychological defense that it was forbidden with, with, with punishment of, of jail if certain facts were, were uh, emitted. Well, I regret very much that time is running off and Eva Linderud is going to have to take the last word and please bring, bring your questions up afterwards if there's, the speakers don't have to leave immediately. Yes. Um, I'm Eva Linderoth, I'm working with Milka, so I'm on the board of Milka's, who arranged this meeting. And I'm very happy to have been able to assist at this meeting and find out properly what the differences are. And uh, I'll take it from there. And I want to thank you very much for coming here, both of you. You have elucidated much. And. <coughs> As a thank you, I'll give you each a little cup, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Can you repeat the handshake? <laughs>